And now I'm going to turn it over to David, who's going to become the, uh, the main speaker, and he's going to share screen and bring up his PowerPoint. Okay, I'd just like to start out by thanking you for this opportunity to talk about the, an almost forgotten character who's had an extraordinary impact on the history of Pacific Grove and enriched the experience of millions of visitors to our little town over the last 70 years. I'd sure like to thank Dale as well for his tireless efforts in bringing this series uh, together. Uh, teaching me to use a Mac for this presentation was certainly a study in tolerance. Uh, yesterday we tried to add a feature to Zoom that would allow me to appear to be talking to you from the Perkins Park oceanfront. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. Uh, so I decided to add a little color here by uh, wearing my Indiana Jones hat in recognition of Hayes Perkins' life as a pioneering working man's adventure traveler. Um, and before we get started, I'd also like to thank John Martin. I'm not sure if John is on the um, talk today. He lives in Colorado, and I believe John is Perkins' great-grandnephew. Um, and he's done an extraordinary effort at writing and posting on the internet a synopsis of the first two volumes uh, of the diary. Certainly a great service to me in getting this project started. Uh, John is also in the process of writing a biography of Perkins, and I look forward to it with great anticipation. And someone else I'd certainly like to thank, um, take this opportunity uh, to thank uh, the interim library director at Pacific Grove uh, Library, Diana Godwin, and all the librarians there who were uh, day after day retrieved the hefty bound volumes for me from the Lock Special Collections cabin there. So my interest in Hayes Perkins began uh, when I decided to write an article on the history of Perkins Park for Eden. Uh, the Journal of the California Garden and Landscape History Society that I contribute articles to occasionally. This is the front cover of that edition. Um, and the more I read, the more I realized that the story of Mr. Perkins was far bigger and more interesting than just the creation of his beautiful garden by the sea as he describes it. He was a man of humble birth and limited education who for 50 years worked his way around the world as a manual laborer and yet also had the imagination and discipline to keep a detailed diary of his travels. As we'll see, his words offer a unique perspective on life, politics, racial and social inequality, war and worldwide travel of that era. It certainly gave me a whole new appreciation of the rights, privileges, and comforts that I enjoy as a traveler today. Okay, so now I have to find my slide um, and I have a full screen here, um, so I'm going to share the screen, um, and Dale, I need some help here. I need pick, to pick, pick the window that has the PowerPoint up in it. Yeah, I. How do I reduce the size of this? It'll automatically get big. Yeah, but I need to reduce this so I can find that window. I've just got a full screen of uh, you in a picture right now. When you pick the share screen, you should be that the window should pop up. Yeah, I did that. A uh, thing has popped up, and there is. Oh, is de there's a desktop there. Maybe that's going to let me no. find it. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, double click that. Okay. And we're already in, uh, all right. And I need to play play from the start. There we go. All right. Okay. Um, so this is uh, this talk I gave to the Heritage Society of Pacific Grove last year. Um, and uh, oh, there's me in my uh, adventures hat there. Well, let's go back one. And uh, title is. Uh, Life and Times of Hayes Perkins, Creative Pacific Grove's Magic Carpet. And we use this picture um, in the magazine to uh, illustrate, illustrate the story. Um, and we'll come back to it because it's an important part of the uh, exposure that the garden received in its early years. So this is the, the magazine article. Um, you can see the full picture as it appeared there in the lower left. And uh, Perkins, um, this is really what uh, started me trying to investigate what he was all about and how he got there. For 14 years, I toiled to make a dream I have entertained since I was a small boy. I wished to have a beautiful garden beside the sea 
and have made it come true. This was in a letter he wrote in 1959. A little bit about Perkins, a really unusual character, born in 1878, uh, we'll get into some more detail on his background, died in 1964 in Pacific Grove, and you can describe him in three ways. He's an adventurer. He worked his way around the world as a laborer, breaking rocks, felling trees, uh, mining diamonds for about 50 years. Um, unusual for some of his background, uh, he made detailed notes of his travels uh, in a diary, um, which was published in a very limited edition of six uh, in 1961. And uh, his skills as a gardener, I sort of found a little bit about that by working through the diary over a long period of time. And there are three major places, um, only actually one detailed description of garden he worked on in the heart of Africa mission um, in, in the Congo in the early 1900s. Uh, he also developed a, a park out in Butler, Pennsylvania, and of course Perkins Park here in Pacific Grove. A few milestones in the life. Um, born in 1878 near Bandon, Oregon to uh, homesteading parents. Um, this was a hard scrabble life. And uh, his, his mother was very important to him in terms of helping him get started. Uh, his father was uh, a, another character altogether. And I'll just read very briefly here. For my father was the Spanish Inquisition type, a stern covenant master who had been brought up a strict Methodist in Tennessee where both my parents were born. Had he been reared in a Catholic family and lived four centuries ago instead of 19th century, he might easily have headed auto defects under Topeka. From my earliest youth, I heard little else but the scriptural text recited in my ears, spare the rod, spoil the child. And it may be said he dutifully did possible, did all possible to make me a Methodist, whether a decent citizen or no. He came nearer rearing a bandit for this forced acceptance of creeds and dogma were unacceptable to my youthful ideas of right and wrong and remained so still. But more of this anon. And I'd like to read much more of the diary, but we just don't have that today. There's 2,000 type pages of it. But I think that gives you a sense of the voice um, of this uh, self-taught writer. So at, 18, at age 15, he quit um, after abuse by his father, left school and began a life on the road with no skills other than his uh, native intelligence and his two ha strong hands. Many, many adventures take place, and this is just a summary. We'll see more of them later. In 1898, uh, at age 20, he made his first uh, sea voyage, sailed around the Cape Horn um, on a uh, four-master. Uh, it was the first of 130 documented ocean voyages around the world. And another note of his diaries, the detail that he kept. We know every boat he took, what date it was, and where and, and when the travel began. Um, then, um, by 1928, at age 50, he began to realize that uh, he couldn't do this the rest of his life, uh, just as a laborer, and he began worst, uh, working on Hearst's properties, both there at Hearst Castle under construction, and the family uh, compound in Wintoon up in Northern California. He f left Hearst in 1936 at the height of the Depression, um, went back east and worked for a gentleman uh, who ran a lab in Butler, Pennsylvania. We'll hear more about him. And uh, Mr. Preston um, was an Englishman who really felt that uh, Perkins' adventures, although not typical of the kind that would be uh, adapted as a member of the Royal Geographical Society um, in London, um, put his name up for membership and he was adopted the only organization that uh, Perkins ever voluntarily belonged to. In 1938, uh, he leaves Pennsylvania, moves to Pacific Grove, uh, continues working for a while until his, an, an his annuities retire um, uh, and begins work on Perkins Park. Over about 14 years, he worked on that park pretty much by himself, but with some help as we'll see later. Um, he did make two more overseas journeys to North Africa, um, in 1955 and South America in 1956. In both these cases, it was as a paying passenger rather than just a worker. In 1961, Frank Preston arranged for his diaries to be typed and bound under the title here and there. And in 1964, he died at Forest Hill Manor in Pacific Grove. 
And this is uh, what those uh, five volumes of the diaries look like in their bound version. They were just, they are carbon copies, so they could only make five or six copies, I think. Uh, one of them is in the library in Pacific Grove, one's with the Royal Geographical Society in London, uh, one's at Cal Poly, there's a long story behind that, one is in Oregon with the Historical Society, and I think one is with the National Geographical Society in New York. Um, I believe the family may have a few Xerox copies, but that's the only volume, bound volume that exists. This is what it's like. Um, extremely well um, indexed and annotated. A table of contents for volume one. Um, and you can see on the right hand side uh, what the first page, and I was just reading from the page behind that. Um, again, to give you a little sense of his voice, when a man writes his own biography, it's conceded he is a liar. So it is as well to admit this fault at the beginning. However, for those who read between the lines, they might find some modicum of, truth, modicum of truth in its pages. Approaching the sundown of life, I wonder how to record the happenings of the fleeting years, what to put in, what to live out. There has to be a beginning, as I have no idea of selling this profit, will care little what those who may peruse it say or think. It's a mere statement of facts and mere facts as I have seen things. And then he goes on to uh, begin the story of his life and uh, 2,000 pages later, we end up on his way to Butler, Pennsylvania in 1936. So I mentioned John Martin earlier. John has created a website called Hayes Here and There, um, and extremely useful to me in developing this talk and the article. Uh, he has done a synopsis of volumes one and two, which cover the period 1878 to 1907. Clearly, I'm not gonna read everything on this slide, it's very busy, but just a sense of that period of time. Uh, he's mining and, went, mining and ranching in the Western US and Canada. He sails around the Horn. Um, he does naval work in San Francisco, mining and mill work in the West. Um, he, uh, logging in Eureka. He was a rustabout for one of the first US geological surveys of Southern Alaska walks across the desert, breaks logs and rocks and logs, and back to Alaska. He did attend high school um, in, when he was in Seattle for a while, um, when he was in his 20s, I think. Uh, the first mention here of Africa, which is very important, um, and on to the volume two. John has very laboriously uh, tried to transcribe some of Perkins' journeys uh, between the period 1890 and 1913 onto the Google Earth project. It's very complicated. The lines and crisscrosses uh, are all annotated, but they just give you a sense of uh, the amount of traveling this guy did. He uh, circled the world eight times, I think it was. So looking at a couple, some specific uh, stories that come out of re reviewing this, uh, in volume one, I've identified uh, that he uh, sails around the horn on a three-masted schooner. This is the boat that he sailed on, the Austrasia, out of Washington. Uh, this picture was taken about 1900. And this was his first sea voyage at 820. Um, going around the horn was a pretty uh, hair-raising experience. And again, I'll just read a few lines from the diary. Well past the horn, but the weather is worse than ever. So great is the rolling and pitching of the ship, the galley is washed out. No food may be cooked, and the best we can expect is a pot of muddy coffee, or what passes for this beverage. The forecastle is awash, and our clothes, our thin blankets, and all is sodden constantly, and no chance to dry them out. But the men are holding up well. For full two weeks, the ship has been wet in all the word means. So that was his introduction to traveling um, and uh, as, a, as a sailor. Again, quickly looking through all those things he did in that first period. Again, I've highlighted uh, the first period that he spent uh, in Nigeria, where he was logging for mahogany in Nigeria. Um, and a couple of uh, notes up here. Um, his first experience in Africa was relatively brief. Um, he was rather shocked at the way the, uh, the native um, 
people were treated. Um, the logs are hauled to the water with men. This requires at least 100 men to drag a log of ordinary size to water. And when possible, whips are used on the men. And I think this was particularly uh, resonant with, with Perkins because of his uh, treatment as a child by his father, where he was constantly whipped every day for his uh, attitude towards religion. Um, he finishes his last note on leaving Africa, leaving the Niger. The Niger, it seems the light will go out of my eyes. I have so longed for Africa, so hoped and desired to do something in this great continent that no other place appeals to me elsewhere. And he kept, keeps coming back again and again. In volumes two and three of the diary, it covers the period 1907 to 1920. Um, again, just all over the world, Canada, Yukon, Australia, New Guinea, Colombo, uh, Aden, Suez Canal, Naples, Spain, England, logging in Eureka again, working on the canal in the Imperial Valley, uh, in Egypt, um, steamers, he, groundskeeper um, at the Heart of Africa mission, which we'll cover. So let's just uh, spend a, a minute or two on his uh, time in the Yukon. So in 1907, um, he travels to the Yukon um, hoping to uh, join in and make some money out of the gold rush. Uh, he was very late. Um, the rush was pretty much over by then. Um, finding no job of any kind uh, with a partner, he buys a boat for $5 and rows this thing 900 miles down the Yukon River in 12 days to catch a steamer to Seattle. Um, and I, I think rowing was probably the easy part. That river was flowing so fast. Um, the problem more, I think, was stopping often. But uh, he did manage to uh, get through that. Um, and again, um, he describes uh, uh, the part that he traveled with uh, was not exactly a sailor, but a dilettante who also thought that they could find a way to make some, uh, some money up in Alaska. He traveled with um, Feodor was his name. Did Feodor want to share my trip down river? He did. Said he didn't know anything about cooking, but was a good oarsman. As to the first part of the statement, he told the truth. But in the last, he was a liar. Anyway, we're put to sea. We have 20 pounds of flour, 11 pounds of bacon, and two pounds of prunes. A coffee pot, a frying pan, two tin plates, and knife forks and spoons. What more does a man want on the Yukon? That was quite a harrowing trip and certainly one of the, as he said, probably one of the worst passages of his life. On to the next uh, highlighted item. As a groundskeeper at the Heart of Africa mission in the Congo, he was offered a, a two-year contract uh, by the mission system uh, to go out there and manage the, the grounds for the missionaries. Um, when he got, he was horrified to figure out that the folks he was working for treated him just like another African slave. Um, and even worse, he found that the way that they manipulated and controlled um, the uh, natives in the mission was basically by beating them and withholding or providing alcohol as necessary. Um, as he points out, this experience with missionaries has been the crowding blunder of my life. I find myself a servant of two charlatans, wholly self-seeking, while pretending to be self-sacrificing devotees of the cause of Christianity. Um, as we know, he wasn't strong on Christianity when he started. Um, this certainly destroyed any further belief he could have in the value of its service. Uh, the picture on the left, um, he does mention, uh, get a couple of mentions in the book about the good job he did in, in managing the, the, the property. Um, but so disgusted with the way the place was managed, he quit and without any money, sets off, if you can believe it, to walk across Africa from the center of the Congo right to the head of the Nile. And then by making a little bit of money along the way, he could occasionally buy food to uh, feed himself on the Nile. There's some, a lot of interesting experiences on there. There's probably a whole book that could be written on, um, his uh, time traveling down on the Nile. I did forget one passage I wanted, wanted to mention here. Um, as he was walking through the jungle, trying to get to the head of the Nile, um, he became very sick and ran out of food. 
and he was helped by two porters that came across him and said, uh, I overheard two of them talking now, just now about me. The white man has nothing to eat, one said, and if a man does not eat, he will die. We have, we have little, but we will share a little with him. And they did, for out of their small store of green plantains and watery sweet potatoes, they brought me the best, refusing to accept money in return. I will always remember this, for without it, I would have eaten nothing this day, nor until tomorrow, if then. It's an act of comradeship I have never seen unequaled during starvation days at sea on the Yukon or anywhere else I have ever been. So the interesting reflection on those that had least were the most helpful to him in his time of need. So he gets back to Africa again um, at the end, towards the end of that uh, volume, um, and is working for the Belgian Fournier uh, Diamond Mining Company. Um, he's very successful at finding diamonds and recruiting people to start the mines, to start the work. Uh, but as soon as he's found something worthwhile, they move him on to the next site. Um, and all the folks that work for him follow him because they know how well they'll be treated in his care. Um, those uh, who had to follow behind and continue the work on his mines, um, this is probably one of the emotional, most emotional writings in the book where he talks about how they were treated um, and the atrocities that it took to get the mines uh, working. Words fail to describe that awful pit as I saw it, for there can be nothing worse in hell. The noonday sun looked down into the steaming quagmire as only the African sun can. The old wounds on the bodies of the pit men were white, pit men being the people working the mine, festered and gaping. Blood streamed with the mud, tinting it scarlet, while the bodies of the pit slave moved spasmodically as the whips led and every bone in their emaciated bodies seemed to show through their skin. That is how we get diamonds. So he quit diamond uh, mining uh, in the beginning of volume four, uh, leaves the Congo um, and decides that uh, after a while in Australia that, uh, as he said, I'm in Sydney again, and when ready we'll go to the islands, meaning the uh, Samoan islands. The enchantment of the glorious sun, Samoan and Samoan of forest and coral beach, of reef and bluish sea beckons, and surely will be a more desirable place of residence than the drab bush where I am right now. Besides, I want to get away from the brutal slave gangs of Africa and the equally hard driving machine age of the USA. But where else but the languorous beauty of the South Seas can this be found? Anyway, I will try it. So off he goes. Um, to uh, the Samoan Islands, uh, where he ran a trading post um, for several months in 1921. And unfortunately, he finds that reality of life in the Samoan Islands is really very little different from the struggles and uh, uh, problems of the rest of the world. I came here to hide away from, after several <coughs> months, he writes, I came here to hide away from the selfishness, the greed, and the pain of the big outside world. But I find it here an even greater force than in my own land. Um, and the place where he was working was uh, fairly close to the Vilima uh, residence of Robert Louis Stevenson in uh, earlier times. So he moves on once again um, and uh, ends up where does he go then? Let me figure this out. Okay, so he's in South Africa, he's in Tahiti, he's in the Congo again. He's blacklisted because of his complaints about the way uh, the workers are treated, so he's unable to get employment again in the mines. Um, he comes back to the US, he joins the Coast Guard at Bandon um, in Oregon where he was born, where he was uh, born. Um, and at that time, he purchases, we find out in his uh, diary, he actually purchased his own Remington portable typewriter. And I tracked down this ad for the Remington portable typewriter that he purchased in 1924. Um, and apparently, I guess he was taking his notes and having them typed up. And he found by investing in his own typewriter, he could save himself a lot of money. 
So I have bought a typewriter, a Remington portable, and I'm delighted with it. I'm putting in every spare minute on my diary in 1924. And these, uh, the earliest example I have of his typing. Uh, I'm afraid it's a copy of a copy of a copy. It's very difficult to read, but he was a prolific letter writer. Apparently he had about a hundred folks throughout the world that he would write extended letters like this to. And this is an example of one that he wrote to his nephew on the kind of things that Frank should consider um, in taking up a career and, and learning. Um, but you can see the intensity of the writing and the density um, and just imagine how many hours he must have spent uh, banging away on that little typewriter. So now we get to volume six. Um, he finally realizes that he's now age 50. Um, he no longer has the strength of a young man. And if he's going to have any chance of saving for retirement, um, he's got to find himself uh, employment in the US, which is a little less strenuous. Um, and he turns up at uh, Hearst Castle. Um, and as he was a teetotaler, they just, people running the, the workforce there just loved the idea of have someone who doesn't drink up there. Um, he was able to find a job and started off again as a laborer. He was just doing backbreaking work for a while, but they quickly realized that he had more skills. And uh, he was put in charge of the zoo animals at San Simeon that Hearst was acquiring to uh, keep in the grounds. So actually over this period of time, he was hired and fired three times. Uh, the first time was when his boss, uh, accidentally tore the horns off one of the valuable exotic animals, blamed uh, Perkins for it, um, and, uh, and his, so Perkins was fired. Uh, apparently Hearst heard about this, um, realized that uh, he couldn't lose such a, a good worker at this time and ordered him hired back onto the team. The other times when he was fired was basically because he was laid off in bad times. Uh, during this period, he frequently came in contact with uh, both Hearst um, and uh, Julia Morgan, and of course, many of the visitors to the, um, to the castle. Uh, he talks about Hearst quite a bit. This whole section of the book is an, almost another book on um, the life and times and the goings on um, at Hearst Castle and the politics and everything else. Uh, again, just to comment here, Hearst has been round the place a lot and I see him daily. He's a large man, rather ungainly in appearances, but always immaculately dressed. When he addresses a man, he speaks quietly and seldom if ever raises his voice. He is uniformly courteous and evidently he understands most of his guests are hanging around him, catching on his every word to try and get something out of him. Some of the more noted actors and actresses are with him. I see Charlie Chaplin, Anshu Manju, how um, who are big enough to stand on their own legs without publicity from Hearst. Marianne Davis makes up the guest list from Hollywood. She knows her hold on the publisher and sees that she holds her rivals off. She is his mistress and her likes and dislikes were more to him than anything else in the world. So there's a lot of information on Hearst Cat if anybody really wants to know what was going on in those days. Um, there's one little story I, I, I like particularly. Um, Under the castle is a vault with double doors. The keys to this vault are carefully guarded, for there are vast quantities of liquors. The finest Europe affords, the old bonded whiskey of prohibition days, everything procurable Hearst has there for his guests. I think Hearst was not a drinker, but he certainly made sure it was available. I've already spoken of booze running into this place constantly, it never ceases. Um, I have seen a ship come alongside the pier at San Simeon and unload 14,000 cases, but not much of it came here, so they're obviously using on shipping. Merely an accommodation to big shot bootleggers from San Francisco and Los Angeles. Last year, when on my vacation in San Francisco, I saw several Coast Guard officers with whom I served in that branch of the service. They asked who was running booze down this way. And I told them Hearst. We don't want anything to do with Hearst, they declared. Do you suppose I want to be chased out of service or transferred to some cold station up on the New England coast? 
tell us something about the smaller fry if we can handle. So that's uh, Perkins on booze. So here we are. He was um, by the 19, let's see, 31, 32, uh, even uh, Hertz money could not support all the projects he had going. Uh, so he was fired from that job and then rehired at Hearst's place up the family compound at Wintu near McLeod, where again, uh, Julia Morgan was helped uh, reconstruct the place. Uh, and you can see a picture of uh, what it looks like, and it is still there, it's still owned by the Hearst Corporation. Um, but even there, when he got started, it was hard labor. So here you have a man in his mid to late fifties, for these eight days I have been lifting great rocks, anywhere from 200 to 1,000 pounds weight into trucks all day long. My muscles are cramped, my legs and arms refuse to obey my will to move. Uh, he did get moved on to um, painting and other duties inside, um, and I think things improved a little for him. Uh, but each of the three years that he was there, during the winter, work would close down, the place would get snowed in. And uh, so he was invited to go across the country to Philadelphia, where this guy Frank Preston that he had worked, met on a, a ship in about 1925, I think, uh, was building a lab with a big park. Um, and a guy called John uh, Crisco um, arranged talks for him, um, where he talked to the locals. So this is a picture of the Nixon Hotel. I don't know if he ever stayed there, but he certainly saw it, and may well have given the tour there, uh, which is in downtown Poplar in Pennsylvania. And I, the, the folks uh, who turned up to hear his stories, these were uh, upper income kind of folks, they really did seem to enjoy my tales of adventures, so different from the rather prosaic business of accumulating dollars, as he noted. And so by 1936, um, things were so bad that pretty much the whole of the activity at uh, Wintoon was closed down. And the last entry in the diary in 1936, uh, he's uh, waiting to uh, take a bus to move across to work for Frank Preston, um, at uh, basically building a game park and landscape in the grounds about, around a glass lab, a, a, gla a research lab for the glass industry, which is obviously very strong in that area. Um, and he worked there for a couple of years. Um, he landscaped uh, the property, planted trees, built structures and miles of fences, and again, all without any mechanical aid. Uh, today, the place is a public park and arboretum. Uh, and he left uh, Butler in 38, I think, because the winters were just too cold. And Preston Park still exists. Uh, much of the work Perkins did there is the trees, of course, now mature and uh, the fences are probably uh, still in place. And it, it's now uh, open, uh, publicly owned property. And finally, he, he moves to Pacific Grove in 1938. Uh, and his choice of Pacific Grove, obviously he wanted to come back to the climate of uh, the warmer winters of the West Coast, and he chose Pacific Grove again as a teetotaler because it wasn't all cluttered up with bars. Um, and here he rented a little 18 by 16 foot converted wash house on Mermaid Avenue, which is just down there from Lover's Point, if you know it. Uh, it's on the house property, which I think the address is now 671 Ocean View, uh, the wash house is long gone, and I think another little property is built on top of it. Um, and here he continued to work for George Lors, who was now a contractor in PG, one of the people he'd worked for when he was employed by Hearst, um, until his annuities matured. Luckily, he managed, didn't spend his money on wine, women, and song, like uh, many of his compatriots had, and so he had a nice little nest egg um, and when that matured in 43, he planned a life of uh, reading in the library, uh, lecturing about his travels, and, and like gardening for his neighbors. Um, on the left is a clipping from the San Francisco Chronicle from 1940, uh, where he did uh, talk about um, his travels, um, and uh, people just loved to, uh, to, to attend the talks. 
Uh, he became quite well known in the neighborhood. I came across this little quote by Jerry Herbert, who was a young man in those days. Um, again, I think it reveals uh, something about uh, Burke's ornery character. During the war, this is of course World War II, he came across the street from his little place on Mermaid and did some gardening for us when he thought my mother was letting the yard get out of hand. That irritated her, and I'm not sure what they, but what they must have had some words. So this is how Perkins started doing a little gardening. gardening. Um, and then he began to realize that lots of kids were playing on the poison oak that had grown all over the buff there to the west of uh, Lover's Point. So he started clearing the area and planting ground cover. Um, again, the, the choice of this, the, the plants that he chose were this a bright pink African plant that he that it was known in those days of mesembranthium. Um, today it's categorized as Trisanthium floribundum. Um, most of the plants in the park are African like this one. I wanted to have something to remind me of the dark continent, for somehow I have always loved it above any other land. And uh, just a quick comment on the uh, choice of ice plant he chose there. Uh, it is in fact a recommended ground cover by the Central Coast um, Invasive Plant Council just because it is not invasive. It's not the hot and tart fig that uh, uh, Caltrans planted all over the country, which is an invasive plant. And it is particularly good for erosion control on steep slopes with poor soil, as well as being very drought and salt tolerant. So knowingly or otherwise, he chose probably the most appropriate plant for that location, unless you're going to put, there is some cry in some areas that like to put poisoned, uh, put uh, uh, plant native plants there. I think if you're going to plant native plants there, the only one that is really native to that area is of course the poison oak that he removed. So over the next 14 years, uh, single-handedly, pretty much, uh, Perkins constructed a one-mile one long, a one mile long uh, park along the Ocean View Boulevard. Over the years, it's become recognized as one of the most unique and widely photographed cultural landscapes on the West Coast. Um, and many visitors from around the world still say it's the primary reason for their come to visit uh, Pacific Trail. They like the Victorians, but there's lots of places that they can see that. There's only one place you can see Perkins Park. Uh, comment from uh, the Pacific Road Tribune of 1947. Any day of the week, if you drive down by the ocean, you'll see a tall, spare, deeply suntanned, athletic looking man with no hat and a ball pate, working away, building pads, planting flowers, and spading and cultivating. And the owner of Borg's Motel, um, you know, that on the corner that allowed him to fill up to 75 buckets of water two days a week from his faucet and hadn't carry him across the street to irrigate the new plantings. Uh, by 1947, the garden stretched to 1,500 feet and the city had actually by now given him permission uh, to use public land for this purpose before he took it. Um, uh, and many neighbors who originally resisted the change uh, were now very happy to support the project. And uh, in 1947, the service club that was the forerunner, forerunner to the, the Pacific Road Rotary <coughs> organized a flower day to collect funds to further the efforts. He used the check for $185.15, about $2,000 today to augment his personal contribution. So all the plants he put in before um, were ones he paid for with himself and supplies. And finally, um, in the 1950s, um, the, the town really woke up and recognized the contribution that he had made. Uh, probably um, concerned at this note that was in the Tribune, Hayes Perkins, who's voluntary land, excuse me, I'll take a sip of water here. whose landscaping has added so much to the beauty of the town, announced that he would no longer continue to work in the park. He's discouraged by the careless or de deliberate vandalism and plans to leave town. Um, we are glad he didn't. He still had plenty more work to do. And he was honored by um, a plaque being placed on a large rock uh, along uh, Ocean View Boulevard there. It is there, if you look carefully, still today by the uh, important folks in the town. 
He did take two more trips. Um, in August 1952, he embarked on a trip to uh, North Africa on a primitive bus loaded with water-filled goatskins and eight passengers to satisfy an ambition to ramble around the Sahara. Uh, but after 2,500 miles of bone-shaking travel and encounters with Tuareg pirates of the desert, he described them, his health deteriorated. He flew back home in December. Um, and it's a mention there in the... Uh, in the Herald. And by 1954, the Monterey Herald reported that, um, assisted by a city employee, uh, Manuel Rego, the garden had been extended five fifths of a mile uh, to another 1,100 feet cleared for future planning. And that takes you right up to the Esplanade today. There's a picture again of uh, Perkins and uh, um, Manuel Rego. And uh, things were getting formalized now. Um, he, want, he suggested that perhaps they could give him a little bit of money in exchange for him completing the park. Um, and uh, in 1953, the council authorized a budget of $2,700 a year. Actually, that's about 25,000 today uh, for manpower, water, and equipment. Um, he accepted a stipend of $14.75 per month um, the rationale he gives is uh, to give me a modicum of authority to hold back vandals, dog owners who train their pets in the park, and bicyclists. Um, bicyclists were one of his pet, bicyclists and pet peeves, I think, were his uh, first, uh, <clears throat> were the things he hated most about uh, the destruction in the park. Uh, he makes uh, one more trip on a Norwegian passenger carrying car cargo vessel. Uh, this time on a month trip, again, as a passenger rather than a worker around South America. And as he points out uh, in a letter uh, at some point, thus ends my 130th sea voyage. I have no plans for further travel. There are no new lands to explore, and I don't care to go over old ground. He, the, he took uh, extensive notes on his travel um, on those two trips to Sahara and to South America. Um, but it's not written up as a narrative, um, and these notes were typed up and are in the library, um, sort of just uh, bound in this little book on, on that, that period of time. So Perkins was pretty dissatisfied with uh, this, the attention that was given to the park. I think it started getting into the same shape and the, had, he had the same kind of plates that many of us do in looking at the state of the park today. And as he wrote in a letter to uh, his friend, uh, Monterey County Supervisor Jacobson, these Latin people are on, this was from his trip in South America. These Latin people are a hundred years ahead of us in creating lovely flower gardens. If you people would get together in the matter of parks as do these South Americans, its fame would be worldwide. Well, um, as we'll see, he didn't have to worry too much about that fame. Um, and I don't remember the date that he moved. It's hidden by little sign that says Bob's iPad. Anyway, in late in the 60s, he moved to Forest Hill Manor. Uh, daily, he walked downhill to continue working on the garden. Uh, but despite his concerns about the quality of the city maintenance, its fame had spread. This is one of the first and most significant pictures uh, that were published nationally. This is from the National Geographic um, of November 1959 um, and shows the park in its heyday. Um, pictures taken by photographers were used for all kinds of, uh, they were on the front of in-flight magazines. So this is an interesting example. Um, it's the Dome Liner um, breakfast menu uh, from the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, above and on the left is a page from Life magazine in 1959 again talking about uh, uh, the, uh, the park and of course uh, the garden receives notice these days sometimes as many as 600 cars per hour that sounds like a lot to me but that's what he rem remembers when it is in fullest bloom to say nothing of the huge transcontinental buses fleets of them that come to town um, Postcards like this mailed across the world attracted even further attention. And I'm back to this extraordinary picture that was shot by Kodak photographer Peter Gales in 1961. 
Um, and Kodak had a display in Grand Central Station in New York, um, 16, 60 feet long by 18 feet wide, where they would display uh, photographs that showed uh, their cameras being used to great advantage. Um, and this is the picture that uh, was up in Grand Central Station, seen by millions. Um, I think it might have been 1968 by the time it was actually used there, although the photograph was uh, shot in uh, 61. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Uh, they wanted somehow to get Perkins to appear in this photograph to honor him for his work, but he declined to pose for the picture in protest of them showcasing his hated hordes of cyclists that were destroying his park. And in doing my research um, on this, uh, I came across this little notation uh, on the Cal Poly San Luis Obispo site that they had a photograph. Um, Hayes Perkins and Simeon Diaries, they called it. It says, Hayes Perkins stands on a Pacific coastal bluff in northern San Luis Obispo County. Well, on looking closely, I could see clearly this wasn't San Luis Obispo County. It was Pacific Grove in Monterey. So I got in touch with the librarians there and uh, went down and visited the archive and lo and behold there's a trove of i think about a hundred letters uh, between frank perkins and frank preston the guy who arranged the time the diaries for him between the period of 1961 and 64. although he wasn't keeping a diary anymore he was still writing furiously about uh, li the life and times in pacific grove and here's a typical letter from let's see 1960 uh, thanks for your good letter. You still seem to be doing a lot of wandering over the eastern part of the states. Um, I don't, yeah. And by the way, I'd love to be in the rapidly changing Congo now. The people could soon discover I was not a Bula Matadi and would open their hearts and especially their wide mouths and give me their version of what is happening and why they did it. I fear that they will later include all Europeans, but they cannot do without them. And again, he talks about what's going on in Pacific Grove, what's going on with the weather, uh, whether the, uh, the whales are in the bay or not now. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of these letters that I was able to go through and just extract little uh, words that helped me uh, understand more about this unique person. Um, and then came across a couple of notes regarding Preston's agreement to type uh, the diaries. Sometimes one, I wonder if my diary merits so much hard work in being retyped by your secretaries, for it is often trivial. I no longer keep a diary and have not for years, other than accounts of, as we said, the Trans-Saharan journey and the trip around South America. It is unlikely I will ever make another long trip, or even a short life expectancy is not great at my present age. Um, and... Uh, Again, is talking about uh, whether they should edit the diary or not, and that is a massive task. And they chose just to type, type it as it was. Uh, I hope it isn't lost, for it is a tale of the time, and no one of this generation can ever write another one like it. And is that true? So per, uh, Preston, who arranged for the typing and the binding of the diaries, um, donated and said one of the sets uh, in the library in the special collections department here in Pacific Grove. Um, and what do we have here? I'm very much in your debt. He's writing to Preston again. I'm very much in your debt for making these copies of my diary. Please too, because you're giving the RGS, the Royal Geographical Society in London, a copy. As to presenting the Pacific Grove Library, a copy, it is very kind. All the possible objection I would have is that there is a possibility of some of my relatives discovering my present whereabouts, and I can't find another hiding place, however our chance it. He had long ago written off all contacts with relatives who had constantly given him grief over the years, asking for money and help in other ways. And an, another interesting thing I came across, I came across this letter in the archives at Cal Poly. Um, and it's from Perkins being written to Hayes. Uh, I had noticed it looked like something had been torn out of the front of that first volume. And he says here, I wish you'd go to the library and get your diary, volumes one or two, and cut out the three pages of forward which I wrote and send them to me. And hoping to get the diary retyped and bound, I may have become liable for your statements and subject to the same laws as liable in yourselves. Thus, if your diary should be made available for general reading after your death and before my death, 
I might be in a bad spot. So obviously, um, Preston was concerned about possible libelous statements getting back to Hurst wouldn't have managed, but all the cronies and others that were there that uh, are maligned in the words would probably get into trouble. So indeed, Perkins tore out those pages, sent them back to uh, Preston. And so this is the only way we know that um, the forward existed because all the letters there at Cal Poly were donated by Preston's uh, widow after Preston passed on. So we do have, we have solved the mystery of the pages torn from the library book. Um, and it gives some interesting background on Perkins written by Preston that we would not otherwise have known. So now we're up to December uh, 1963, I think. Um, John, thanks for your good long letter. It's the longest I've had for a long time. It's the sort I like. When younger, I carried perhaps a hundred correspondence. But in these days, I have a few regular ones, and most of the others I write about with hope of answer. To sick and crippled people whom I once knew well, but are not and able to answer, I still carry a few foreign ones, but seldom get theirs now. So he goes on and talks about um, some interesting family history that even the family was hoping that this material would not turn up. Um, and uh, that's a whole other story buried in there. But again, he goes constantly being upset by the way that his uh, garden is being looked after. It seems strange that the man has done so much for this town as I have should be hated, but I am by many. It is, of course, envy and jealousy. Last year, the city council said they had $150,000 worth of publicity for an expense of less than $3,000. And most of this came through the park I made for them. I don't regret doing it, but sometimes I wonder if my time was wasted. All my life, I have dreamed of a lovely park beside the sea when I grew old. So that's his uh, complaint on uh, he, the state of the garden. He has quite a bit of commentary on the price and what he considered the appalling food at the Forest Hill Manor. I hope it uh, has changed um, for everyone's sake. Um, so we're getting towards the end of his life now, 1964. Um, he sent the, a close this picture in a note to, uh, to Preston. Here are a couple of pictures of my park when I cared for it. It was likely the most photographed park in the country, but then since I've become too old for it, has no care. The shrubs are broken or dead, etc. And this is the final letter that I came across. Dear John, this is... Um, uh, <sighs> This is not the letter John or answer. It's to say, I want you to keep the data. He had sent a lot of information to his cousin, John. Um, I sent you concerning Hearst. If you think it is not too strong, you can let your sister Mary see it, but better keep it after that, at least until I am dead. This may be sooner than one would think. I've been fading a lot recently and don't think I will last longer. I'm 86 now and will get no younger. The diabetes, and he died there um, in Forest Manor in April 1964. Got a lot of publicity um, in the local papers um, and left his in entire estate, which again, I can't see the number, I think it's a couple of thousand dollars, uh, that today is worth, would be worth uh, 50, about $53,000, $54,000 to the library for the purchase of books. Um, a couple of interesting uh, limitations. C kindly pushes books after my demise as follows. Nothing political or religious. Uh, only the best fiction. Specialized in engineering, mechanical trailing, nothing pertaining to war. Farming, geology, flying, any branch of useful science for many boys. As for women and girls, use your own judgment. And uh, obviously the city accepted the money and recommended the library board please place a small plaque um, in memory of Hayes Perkins at the library. And I'm certainly hoping we can get something 50 years or more later um, in the renovated library when it reopens. So the images uh, of the park continue to be used to this day. This is the front cover of Life magazine in 2005, um, a recent edition of the tourist guide uh, issued by the, uh, the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, um, and of course, the stories about the decline in the garden. 
about every three or four years, the Herald would get letters and other information that um, this one was particularly prescient uh, from John Limper. I don't know him. This was probably in the 1970s, as he said, Hayes told me innumerable times when I'm dead, the city will let all my work go to hell. In addition to being civic minded and a top flight gardener, Hayes was also an accurate prophet. Um, in recent uh, times, I'm pleased to say the city is paying a lot more attention. Um, they have had uh, a volunteer coordinator who organized uh, folks uh, regularly to work on the garden. Uh, there is somebody now working, there was somebody until the recent shutdown, working uh, half time uh, to clean up the park and is beginning to show some signs of improvement, but there's still a lot of work. Um, as part of the coastal plan, uh, the council has solicited a design concept from landscape gardeners to how the park can be designed most efficiently to uh, maintain the beauty um, of uh, what we have there already. And there are some groups of uh, folks locally who uh, organized themselves into a group called Friends of Perkins Park, um, who are hoping to work with the city to uh, make sure that it retains it, its beauty. So finally, um, this, as I said, was based on an article, Hayes Perkins, The Magic Carpet. Uh, you can download a PDF from the CGLHS website, or you can visit uh, uh, medium.com uh, for uh, an online version of that article. And I'm sure we can figure out a way to get those links to you if necessary. So, end of slideshow, stop sharing.